Welcome everyone to the virtual preview and sneak peek for Staying Power, an outdoor art exhibition and program series hosted at the Village of Arts and Humanities and curated with Monument Lab. I'm Trisha Kim, Associate Director of Public Engagement at Monument Lab, and I'm so excited to be here with all of you tonight. I'm calling in from New York City, which like Philly, is on the ancestral lands of the Lenny Lenape community their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. Now, over the last two years, our teams at Monument Lab and The Village have been working together to imagine an exhibition that invites artists, residents of the neighborhood, and visitors to reflect on two central questions driving the project. What is your staying power in your neighborhood? What is your staying power in a city and world that are rapidly changing? The exhibition opens outside for everyone on May 1st and runs through July 10th. There will be options for in-person socially distanced tours and, of course, online streaming and viewing. Tonight, we mark this moment right before the opening to celebrate the artists, the fellows, and the organizers. Staying power wouldn't have been possible without the Village and Monument Lab teams. And here, I wanna give a special shout out to the brilliant Jeanette Lloyd, Naomi Jovin, Daniel Jackson, and Dina Paula Rodriguez. Thank you all for your labor, vision, and generosity. We'd also like to thank our supporters, especially the Pew Center for the Arts and Heritage, who provided major support for staying power to the Village of Arts and Humanities. Tonight is a night of sneak peeks and exclusives. And while we hope you come to the Fairhill Heart Tramped neighborhood in North Central Philly to see Staying Power in person, we wanted to bring the exhibition to you tonight. First up is the premiere of the Staying Power trailer made by exhibition videographer, Daniel Jackson. Let's take a look. The Village of Arts and Humanities, curated with Monument Lab, present Staying Power, an outdoor art exhibition and program series in the Fairhill Hard Tramp neighborhood of Philadelphia. Staying Power asks artists, residents of the neighborhood, and visitors, what is your staying power in the neighborhood? What is your staying power in a city and a world that are rapidly changing? Staying power for me just means like my sense of creativity, what I contribute to the community, just my sense of style, my presence. If you decide to start something, you must stay with it. If it pertains to one's neighborhood or community, stay with the people that you have lived with, stay with them no matter what they think, and stay with your own first thoughts. Staying power is basically uplifting one another. Staying power is being around forever. Now, this exhibition has been in the works for over two years. Now, I'd like to welcome to the virtual stage uh, representatives of teams from the Village of Arts and Humanities and Monument Lab. From the Village of Arts and Humanities, we have Aviva Kappist, Michaela Palmels, and Lillian Dunn. And from Monument Lab, co-curators for this project, Ariel Julia Brown and Paul Farber. Welcome, everyone. How are you? Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, everyone. So I'm so excited to be able to get all of you here today. And I have a few questions. Uh, my first is for The Village. So The Village is an organization that is over three decades old and has long stood as a center for art, community, and power building. Aviva, I was wondering if you could tell us or if you could situate this exhibition in your organization's history. Sure. Well, I think it's important to first um, recognize that the village itself is a really important representation of staying power um, among, I think, nonprofits nationally. We're a middle sized community based organization that dances among and between art and community development in a city that has so few resources dedicated to either. And like you said, we've been around for, you know, 36 years. Um, and our neighborhood and our first community, the people of the Fairhill Hartramp neighborhood, 
endures relentless challenges to their staying power. Systemic disinvestment, economic violence, mass incarceration, and really every other socioeconomic challenge you can think of. Sorry, I've got a child trying to assert her staying power in the background here. Um, so for the village, the notion of an exhibition within and with the neighborhood, it has to go beyond presentation of artworks and concepts and questions. Yeah. And this ex exhibition is, I think, a phenomenal exercise in stretching the boundaries of how an art exhibition can make monetary and other capacity building investments in a place and in the people who make the place a community. So really, um, for us, this had to go beyond uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. And it came in a moment when you know, the village itself is interrogating what our role is and has been in growing the staying power of the neighborhood and its residents, what it's been for the last 36 years, what it can be, and really what it must be. So, you know, we're both a host and a participant in this inquiry. You know, we're so excited to introduce audiences to dig into themselves and also ask what their relationship to staying power is and must be. And we're so excited, you know, to invite people to the Fairhill Hartramp neighborhood where when you arrive, if you were coming, you know, on a tour, the first thing we would let you know is that we have been, my whole team, you know, and everyone that came before us, we've been gifted the relationships that came before us that helped to build this space of creative expression and creative imagining. Um, and as you enter, we are giving you that gift of trust and that relationship. And so we extend that also to everyone on this call, though it's virtual. Um, and just to remember that the thing that builds a place and makes a place have staying power and the people have staying power is those relationships and how we serve each other. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, Monument Lab, your or our last exhibition in Philly was a citywide project back in 2017. I was wondering if you could walk us through why the next step of working in Philadelphia specifically was to work in a neighborhood with the village. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Patricia, and thank you to all of you for being here. Um, I think, you know, just picking up on what Aviva said about relationships um, is really key that this is an exhibition um, that would not be possible without lots of care, listening, collaboration um, with the village. And we feel really grateful and honored to have been invited into the sacred space of the village and into relationships that are deeply a part of this project and have fueled it. Um, you know, uh, in the past, Monument Lab um, in different moments had you know, we had done a citywide exhibition with our, our friends at Mural Arts Philadelphia in 2017. We've worked in a few other places um, and still, you know, call Philadelphia home. But really thinking about what it means to work in a neighborhood, a neighborhood as a site of memory. A lot of times we think about monuments, our eyes turn to the city square, um, but actually it's neighborhoods where memory lives, where civic bonds are knit together. Um, and I think, frankly, when you, know, you think about all of the places to think about monuments, the village um, is not only a monument um, to years and years of collaboration, but features sculptures, artworks that are all products of relationships between artists and residents. And so of all the places to, to be, to keep thinking, to keep learning, um, it really felt natural to turn to our partners who we've been in conversation with in different ways over the last um, five or so years, um, but really concentrated the last two years. Um, but I'm going to pass it over to, to co-curator Ariel, um, who may have some thoughts as well. Indeed. Um, yeah, I love, Paul, this, this kind of, um, yeah, this drawing this line between um, the work of um, the focus on the city square in, in relationship to the neighborhood. And I think about this neighborhood in particular, and um, I was really honored before this um, project began to um, be briefly in conversation with and collaboration with the Europa project um, and their lifting of Arthur Hall and the legacy of Ile Ife Humanitarian Center. Um, and 
yeah, thinking about um, the work of Arthur Hall's performance, um, gathering, convening, making, um, and traditions of place, um, and how folks uh, learn, uh, determine, self-determine how they walk down the street, what that has to do with monumentality, what that has to do with one's own um, sense of um, sense of, of ability to stay and um, and and neighborhood identification. Um, yeah, I feel like there is so much there for us to learn um, and um, for us to share. That was really beautiful. I love what you said um, to learn about one's own mo monumentality and their ability to stay. That's um, I think that's really provocative and informative, and picks up a little a lot on what Aviva was telling us about the importance of building staying power in the place of the village. Um, Michaela, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more um, on what it means to build power. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. Um, as an organization, I think the village, our main objective with respects to building power is, is supporting people and place-based and community-centered solutions to issues that impact our neighbors, our neighborhood, its residents. In practice, um, our goals and vision for building power is, is really to create the conditions for a collaborative and community-based practice of coming together to maximize mobility, to um, uh, determine and identify solutions towards eliminating systemic barriers and I think ultimately creating one's own solutions and, and really thinking about and centering self-determination and I'll, I'll give you some examples of what that looks like in practice at the village and how our neighbors practice that. Reek, for example, is a resident who after experiencing incarceration created Bros Night this is a monthly event at the village where men from the neighborhood who um, come together to write letters to their loved ones who are currently locked up. And in between these events, Reek takes photographs of the streets, of houses, of the neighborhood essentially, um, and includes those pictures and photographs along with the letters and the men who come to Bros Night select photos to go alongside the letters. So he's essentially bringing memory to folks who are currently incarcerated. He's bringing the neighborhood, the, in, the outside to the inside and creating a space for folks who are currently incarcerated to remain in their neighborhood, even when they're not physically there. Mm -hmm. um, another example is the Fair Hill Harf Trent Playground Alliance. And a few years ago, community members came together to create this alliance with a, a goal of reopening a community rec center that had been shuttered for years that had a long legacy and again this theme of memory that so many folks and elders had memories around of actually building and creating that rec center and um, having this this vision for and reimagination of what that rec center could be today and they actualized that um, and created an after school program that you know pre-covid they were in a process of figuring out how do they expand a service that they created that was much needed and, and used by children and young people in the community. So I think ultimately building power is, is inextricably linked to people being able to make decisions for themselves and have the resources that they need to actualize those decisions. And our role as the institution is really to be a convener and a connector and when we can, a resource provider so that we can support the self-determination of the people that we work with. Thank you so much, Michaela. I really love what you said about um, drawing on personal and collective memories um, as a way to facilitate that work. I want to shift now from sort of this uh, focus on sort of the city and the local, or build on it rather, um, and turn to the second of the central questions of this project, um, Monument Lab. Um, you know, the second project, or the second question, asks about staying power in a rapidly changing world. I was wondering if you could tell us about what it's been like um, working collaboratively um, during a global pandemic, as well as during one of the largest global uprisings uh, confronting systemic racism? Yeah, I'll start that off. Um, you know, I think I, I want to really start this conversation um, 
um, just talking about the the work of re really how um, how much muscle it takes to come together and build a project like this in the middle of a pandemic. Um, it, how much, um, uh, yeah, willfulness it takes um, to draw near to people that you can't actually draw near to, um, and and the work of trust building in that. Um, and that's something that I feel like I've experienced through the fellowship program. And I really want to lift up the work of um, and some of the thoughts of um, Natasha Mosley, who is a young person in the program who um, is really looking at um, gentrification in the neighborhood and really talking about the images that were broadcast in the media through the uprisings, um, the images of young Black people um, looting um, and what work that does for how she sees herself, for how she sees other young people in the neighborhood, um, and her deep, um, full-throated assertion of uh, the work that she has to offer, the, the love and the light that she has to offer her community. Um, I think that the process of building this work um, in the midst of these times has really been about a depth of listening um, to the community members we're in conversation with um, through this moment um, and what it means for them to be in this neighborhood um, moving through uprisings, moving through a pandemic. And yeah. we're gonna... Well, I was just, I was just gonna you know, add to that and, and thinking back to even the opening moments of invitation about the project and kind of the homework that we had to do to step in and, and thinking to, um, of course, as, as Ariel and others have mentioned, the, the predecessor to the village, the Ile Ife Humanitarian Center, and it growing out of the both the model cities program, but also a earlier generations reckoning with systemic racism, with police brutality, state violence, with disinvestment, and that one of the solutions or one of the ways through that was to imagine um, a cultural center um, that would be situated in the neighborhood, and that is, uh, you know. Uh, and, and there's lots of stories here to read about in our newspapers and hear from others um, that, that really fueled what would later become um, the village. But thinking about that now, generation plus later, we're here at some of the very same questions and what it means to think about for us as curators, as learners, to learn from the way the village has demonstrated their staying power. You know, and I'm thinking just back and even in this project, um, you know, we started it in person. Um, Michaela and I were able to take a flight to Chicago to meet with our artist, Ebony G. Patterson, um, but it was like the first time that we had face mask. And then I remember that day we're meeting with Mark Strandquist and Courtney Bowles and the People's, People's Paper Co-op and Aviva and Michaela come in, um, this is like March 13th, 2020, and say like, we gotta go, we gotta shut down. And just what it meant to try to do site visits and um, planning and the fellows program and how um, revelatory it was even just a few weeks ago when we gathered together in a room for the first time with every door and window open with all our masks on and what it meant. It felt like walking anew, but also walking back into all of the stories that we have been talking about of why we were doing this exhibition. And it just, it renewed, I think for, for many of us, the sense of purpose and the openness to needing to keep learning. Mm. I wanna follow up on that um, and ask you Monument Lab, um, as an organization, we define monuments as statements of power and presence in public. It's our working definition. It's useful because it's so broad in a way. Um, but I was wondering how working on this exhibition, again, socially distanced, but also with willfulness um, and with, um, uh, sort of trust building in mind, um, how working on this exhibition, Staying Power, has perhaps inflected or changed that definition or informed that definition in new ways, perhaps? I think that's part of what we really want to learn as part of the exhibition, because um, some of the learning we've gotten to do with our artists, with our fellows, with our, our co-organizers at the village, but a lot of this is now on all of you who will attend um, in person. Um, or from afar and appreciate and help answer these questions of what is staying power in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if anything, 
just quickly, I mean, if you want to understand the story of monuments, um, maybe we're thinking of traditional or conventional or sanctioned monuments. Yes, you could, there's a lot of places you could go in the city of Philadelphia, but if you want to understand the monuments that have emerged in relationship, in dynamism, with people's fingerprints on them because they helped build them, go to the Village of Arts and Humanities because there are sculptures that were made a generation ago with cement, chicken wire, um, mosaics, sometimes even furniture inside. There are all kinds of sites of memory. You have to kind of walk in and it's a, it's a living um, invitation to learn and kind of humble yourself to the, to the place. Mm -hmm. So I think, again, there's all kinds of places you can go see art. There's all kinds of places where you can think about um, questions about the city, but the layers that live there, again, it's just constantly a place for us. Even when working the artists and seeing all that they've come forward that we'll share, it just is an environment that, that invites you to ask of it and ask of yourself too. So my last question is for Lillian. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the role that storytelling plays, uh, both in the context of staying power and um, in the village's work more broadly. I mean, that's a wonderful question and one that is like novels length <laughs> um, of answers and artworks and entire art campuses of um, answers. Um, an exhibition worth of answers. Uh, but um, I think that we've already heard the word story like many times just now. And um, when I first, um, I just wanna, you know, for the for attendees who have not been to the village, the photos that you're seeing behind us are all uh, art parks on our campus, our campus, we call it the village heart. It's um, several square blocks that has about 20 different art parks and murals. And um, the work of the village is actually spread over many more square blocks um, starting in roughly the mid eighties and has created artworks from then until that are continuing to be created now. Um, and all in collaboration with community members and artists um, from the neighborhood and from outside of the neighborhood. And when I walked on uh, the Village Heart for the first time about almost 10 years ago, um, you just instantly know that they're, that these artworks are transmitting story and they, that their function is to um, keep and continue stories of Black self-determination, uh, Black culture and history, um, and youth self-determination as well. Um, it's definitely very much an intergenerational space. Um, the mural that's behind Paul is one of the signature murals and it is actually the figure of the owl um, kind of guarding over and passing down wisdom through generations to all the beings who then pass it on in turn. Um, and I think that the, the function of the artworks when you come, it's, it's very beautiful that we're having this exhibit because part of our job at the village is to preserve and communicate the history that those um, that the artworks hold and we need to continually open space and serve as a platform for the stories that are emerging now and that need to be told now and so um, between the amazing artists who come um, to, as featured in staying power and the fabulous neighborhood curatorial fellows we are hoping that this space again adds another layer of stories that are need to be told in this year um, but that will also communicate kind of and ripple out through generations. Um, and uh, if you want to learn more about many of the legacy artworks at the village, there um, is going to be some coverage of that in the Staying Power newspaper, which will be up online soon. And we're also gonna do a little highlights on our Instagram with some of the histories of the, of the art parks. Thank you so much, Lillian. Now, before we move on to learn more about the artists and neighborhood fellows, I'm wondering if anyone um, in this group wants to add any last words, um, share anything that the vis visitors might want to know. I have one last thing, which won't surprise anybody here, but uh, <laughs> I, um, I was thinking when Lillian was talking about um, one of my you know, favorite uh, people I've gotten to meet in the 11 plus years I've been at the village. And um, it's uh, one of the alumni uh, from Ile Ife who performed and built and dreamed with Arthur Hall. Um, his name is uh, Brother Quasi. And I remember when I first uh, got to know him, I asked him why uh, he kept coming back. 
you know, what it was that kept him coming back, even though the, the organization had changed so much over time. And, you know, there were touch points for members of Eli Ife at times, and then there weren't. And he said that for him, it was because the place itself, that space, it had to have magic because he couldn't, there was no other way that there could for a half century, for more than a half century, there could be that enduring, just again, just this unending creativity, um, music, ideas, possibility, aspiration, inspiration, just all in one place and it wouldn't go away. And he called it magic. And I truly, um, I feel that and I, I believe that um, in, in the work we do today. And it's, I think it's what we have to continue to steward in the future. It's our staying power. Thank you so much, Aviva um, and Michaela and Lillian for um, sharing your wisdom and being so generous with your time. Um, I'd love to ask for Paul and Ariel to stay on stage, on the virtual stage, as we learn more about all of the invited artists who have been working tirelessly over the last year on their prototype monument projects. Now, to give us an exclusive look at what's coming next for uh, what's coming for next week's May 1st opening, Paul and Ariel, our co-curators, will share some more information about each project here. Thank you, Tricia. I'm going to share my screen um, for all of you. And just, you know, um, just an immense, again, shout out to um, and, and appreciation for all of the team at the Village, the team at Monument Lab, um, and all the folks out there. Especially, I want to give special recognition to the artists who, um, whether they have been able to make site visits here or they've been working from afar, um, there's been a profound amount of commitment from them and vision and love. Um, and, you know, some of the artists are from Philadelphia, growing up a few blocks away. Um, some are newer to Philadelphia and others um, are not from here, but are sending their own um, kind of offerings to the space. So without further ado, we're going to give you the first ever sneak peek at all five of the Prototype Monument Artist Projects um, for Staying Power. So first is Sadie Barnett's Family Style 2. Um, and Sadie Barnett channels the past into the present in her works by building spaces of connection and refuge. She's long been captivated by the living room as a space of personal significance, intimate gathering, and political possibility. So for staying power, Barnett created a storefront living room display built around a sparkled couch, custom wallpaper, and a framed photograph of her aunt Vivian. Um, after virtually touring the Germantown Avenue corridor um, last year, she chose to focus um, an installation at the Village's community storefront on Germantown Avenue as this place to call upon the staying power that happens in the living room that marks the public and personal um, and, and familial places of imagination and resistance. And she's called her project a love letter um, to the neighborhood and to the city. Hey, and here we have Philly's own Black quantum futurism, um, Kamea Yewa and Rashida Phillips, Reclamation Space Times. Black quantum futurism is a world-renowned world artist collective whose projects are rooted in North Philadelphia, led by Kamea Yewa and Rashida Phillips. Black quantum futurism brings together quantum physics, Afrofuturism and Afro diasporic concepts of time, ritual, text, and sound. For Staying Power, they proposed a multi part sound sculpture and installation that builds on their ongoing Community Futures Lab and related projects that bring together the neighborhood's past, present, and future into new or reconfigured nonlinear relationships. Reclamation Space Times includes monumental. Oral Futures booth, which also serves as an audio recorder that collects sounds from residents and passersby, and a sound bath accessible through the directional speakers that radiate with a soundscape as listeners move toward the Tree of Life mosaic in the Village of Arts and Humanities Meditation Park. 
Next is Courtney Bowles and Mark Strandquist in collaboration with Tamika Bell, Paulette Carrington, Star Granger, Ivy Lenore Johnson, and Yvonne Newkirk. And their project is called When They Come Home. As artists and cultural organizers, Courtney and Mark produce meaningful public projects through creative coalitions that seek remedy against and alternatives to the injustices of mass incarceration. For staying power, they responded to the exhibition central prompt by seeking responses from those missing from the neighborhood with close attention to women serving life term or lo uh, long term or life sentences. They asked further who has been displaced, who is fighting to help them return. So for this project, Bowles and Strandquist collaborated with five women whose lives were or continue to be ensnared by long term and life sentencing. They, they are building crown shaped wooden sculpture that features monumental portraits produced with their collaborators, encircled by etched poems and fragments of text um, in which their collaborators recall or imagine liberatory days of release. One portrait included in the sculpture is held as a silhouette to acknowledge the names of women, mentors, and sisters who passed away before their life sentences were commuted. The sculpture also includes QR code audio interviews um, and in, above it, a web of 200 string lights that blinks in different deliberate color formations and is based on data about incarceration rates for women in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania as a call for locked up women throughout the area to imagine being able to come home. Over to you, Ariel. Ariel, on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, it was with that. Um, here we have Ebony G. Patterson's she is. Ebony G. Patterson creates imaginative and multi-layered installations, paintings, sculptures, and scenes that channel beauty as tools for reflection and resistance. For Staying Power, Patterson sought to honor the labor of women in, re in relation to the whaling and the land. Patterson proposed a vision for She Is a series of large scale works that could adorn the facades and walls of buildings throughout the village's campus parks, each with a call to the under-acknowledged labor of women in this neighborhood and others, especially in acts of care, protest, and mourning. Each of the four scenes created by the artist includes headless monumental figures embedded in dreamlike and embellished gardens punctuated with a poetic phrase and call to acknowledgement. She is the memory, she is the nourishment, she is the soil, and she is the morning. Finally, Deborah Willis, Black Women and Work. Artist and photography historian Deborah Willis grew up in North Philadelphia, several blocks away from the Village of Arts and Humanities, across Broad Street in a section of the neighborhood also known as the Village. For her site-specific Staying Power project, Black Women in Work, Willis collaborated with local photographer Naomi Ajoven on a series of portraits of women entrepreneurs in North Philadelphia. Fashion designer Lucretia Cree Russell, Baker Tamara Tucker, entrepreneur and artist Asia Shambliss, and activist and fiber artist Ms. Nandi Muhammad. For each portrait taken during the COVID-19 pandemic, Willis joined the women by Zoom, interviewed them alongside Staying Power Project Manager Jeanette Lloyd, and then worked with Joven on directing portraits of the women's work and home spaces. Um, these will be installed as monumental prints on scaffolding adjacent to the village's Ile Ife Park, and the project also includes um, images and a clothesline sig uh, significant with the artist's childhood and family, the village, and North Philadelphia. If we were in a room right now, we would say, please give a resounding round of applause and lots of praise and gratitude to the staying power artists.
Thank you so much, Paul and Ariel. Um, and now we have actually two of the Staying Power artists, Deb Willis and Sadie Barnett, joining us. And I have the joy of asking them a few questions and um, being in conversation with them to sort of learn more about their projects. How are you, Deb and Sadie? Great, thank you. Oh, thanks for having us. So nice to meet you. I am a huge fan of both. Um, and my first question is for Deb. Um, you grew up in North Philly and your family is rooted there. Can you tell us what it means to you to participate in Staying Power? Well, it's really exciting for me uh, because I'm, as you mentioned, I'm from North Philly, but I'm also from the North Philly area that's called the village. Hmm. And so the connection for me was just, uh, just, a, a pure a pure link to my history as an image maker, someone rooted in North Philly, but also the marble stairs, you know, the steps, the storytelling aspect of it, as Lillian mentioned. So for me to work with this project is significant because I also was around when Ile Ife began and the aspect of going into that community back in the 70s was another exciting moment for me to share stories about you know, the global village of Africa and what it meant to me as an image maker and an artist during the 70s. Sadie, you are also one of our featured artists, but due to the pandemic, you've been working virtually, as Paul mentioned. Um, your project is described as a love letter from Oakland to Philly. Can you tell us what it's been like preparing for this? Yeah, you know, um, first of all, thank you for having me. And it it was a challenge, you know, I, I think the vision originally was to come and spend time in the neighborhood to get to know the neighborhood. Um, you know, being invited to the neighborhood is an honor that I don't take lightly. And because of the pandemic, we weren't able to have that type of exchange but I will say that there are some communities that are able to shine, you know, and you can feel the warmth even through the digital platform. And that is really what I experienced, you know, while I wasn't able to be there on the ground, I was able to get, you know, just a glimpse into what Monument Lab is doing, what the village is doing and has been doing for so long. Um, and it took, you know, a bit of shifting and reorienting on everyone's part, but I was also met with a lot of care um, and, you know, shout out to everybody who awkwardly FaceTimed, you know, Akeem to show me, you know, the sites that I could consider, um, to Matthew and Lucia for leading the install on the ground there. And, you know, really to Paul, Aviva and Michaela, I feel like while there were a lot of challenges, everything was made even more special and careful and tender because of the really difficult challenges that we are facing, you know, personally and globally. Speaking of tenderness, um, a theme that is in both of your projects is, um, well, is a theme of home. Uh, both of your works really invite viewers into these intimate, private, and very personal spaces. And I was wondering if both of you could comment on um, how the notion of home figures in your projects. And I'm also curious to know if um, your ideas about the concept of home have changed at all through the process of um, uh, working on these projects. I'd like to just start off with the fact that both of us I think we're looking at wallpaper. Mm -hmm. You know, at the same time, because I had a project that be, because we had to change a few times as well, I wanted to use wallpaper because back in the 50s and 60s, my father was a policeman and he also was, well, he wallpapered homes and, and had a grocery store. So he had many businesses, but home life for me was truly about storytelling and that sofa. And so when I saw, you know, Sadie's sofa and the wallpaper and, and the pink and the joy and all of those experiences, I connected to my own home and that sense of, you know, women and, and joy, you know, when they're posing for the camera or, or they have a stylized ho home and that sense of identity is formed, that was a transformation for me and it's still going on today 
specifically we had a backyard we had to hang clothes on the clothesline and i wanted to also incorporate a clothesline as a communication vehicle where people when they were hanging clothes we're talking to people on the street walking by talking to the neighbor next door so the idea of communication was constantly going on and i and i see and there's a there's a telephone booth next to your piece <laughs> you know so we're all communicating constantly yeah there's a lot of connections um that i feel from you know my work to Deb's piece to Ebony's work. And I think when I think about home and I think about, you know, why I said that the piece was a love letter because I really think of it as, um, you know, I like to speak about what I know and speak from where I am. You know, the love letter, it's in my voice, but it's for everyone. It's for all of y'all. It's for North Philly, which, you know, I understand there to be a lot of similarities to Oakland, which is where I'm from, you know, whether it's um, intentional deinvestment plan gentrification, but also, you know, these neighborhoods and these cities really having a staying power of being themselves, you know, um, a swag, a character. These are places where when you're from there, that's a part of who you are and you carry it with you and it comes into the room with you. Um, and I think also of home, you know, as these sort of, um, small moments that represent the bigger moments. I think of, um, you know, the kind of everyday acts of radicality and hospitality that are happening in these living room spaces. You know, in my installation, it pays tribute to my Auntie Viv, but I know that, you know, a lot of people have their own auntie whose living room was really a portal into, you know, political debate, into poetry, into sharing meals, into, you know, also maybe hospice loss and grief um, and all of these things that you know really make up um, our families both on a personal level and you know our human family as well. Thank you so much that was really moving um, truly I, thank you thank you for sharing that um, it just I had flashbacks to my own home and my own family uh, growing up and so um, I really appreciate your time. Um, now we will learn some more about our neighborhood curatorial fellows. And I'd like to now welcome Ariel back onto the virtual stage. A part of the journey of planning involved working with five amazing neighborhood residents, Celine Cooper, Aisha Chambliss, Frederick Harris, Ms. Nandi Muhammad, and Natasha Mosley. Ariel, could you please uh, introduce some more about the curatorial fellowship um, and, and a little bit more about their work? Indeed. Um, yeah, so I want to just, um, first of all, give thanks for their work in the world and in the neighborhood. Um, their, their, work, um, their work makes our work possible. Um, their questioning makes our questioning possible. Um, I want to um, start with this naming, this um, articulation of them as neighborhood curatorial fellows, um, because I want to think about, I want us to understand that their uh, lifetimes, that their body of work across their lives, um, however short, and in, in the case of um, Natasha, who's uh, um, 18, um, and Ms. Nadi, who is um, a, a, an elder of the village, um, that their work over their life um, is committed to the question of staying power in the neighborhood in a variety of ways. Um, and that they have selected their programs, um, built their programs, curated their programs from the process of editing and redacting and expanding and dilating that question for themselves over the last three months. Um, so we have gathered every Wednesday evening for the last three months to talk about what staying power is in the neighborhood. We have had guest speakers come through from various other cities and from Philadelphia as well to talk about how they excavate that question in their own artistic practice. Um, and we are deep in the work of um, finding ways to really be with the depth of curiosity that that question invites us to. Um, how to find new ways to 
um, be with the wonder of the neighborhood, um, even, even as we are relegated to the tightness of our homes. Um, we have very recently began to meet in person um, and kind of experience what it is to um, be in the same room together, as Paul mentioned earlier. Um, but these projects, um, these projects that they are calling in, they range from thinking about the futures of homeschooling um, in the pandemic and beyond, um, to thinking about the work of a uh, recollection of what the neighborhood has looked like over the decades and what it might look like into the future, to women's empowerment, to fashion and style and um, the work of, of choiceful adornment um, in public, um, to the work of amplifying black fatherhood. So these projects are expansive, these people are expansive um, and without any more, I would like to um, give you an opportunity to learn a bit more about them and their work. I am Asia Chambliss, a multi-business owner, born and raised in North Philadelphia. I have an event planning business, a mobile hookah bar, director and choreographer of a dance company, and I do entertainment. My name is Miss Nandy. I'm a longtime resident of this community and an associate of the village. Salim is an artist. And when I say artist, I don't mean just artists of one particular art. I like to call myself a jack of all arts. Some people say a jack of all trades. I say jack of all arts because if it has to do with art, I most likely know how to do it or can learn it pretty fast. My name is Frederick Flex Harris. I'm a photographer, videographer. Um, I'm a scholar. I'm a recent graduate of Temple University, class of 2010. And my passion is, is creating visual arts that make a difference. Staying power for me just means like my sense of creativity, you know, what I contribute to the community, just my sense of style, my presence. Uh, staying power to me is giving community members a reason to stay. Uh, I feel that a lot of um, things that's going on in the neighborhood, uh, especially where I come from, uh, it's like basically forcing people out. Um, so staying power to me is like, it's like giving people reason to stay and you know to create and build in, in the community that they grew up in. Staying power through woman empowerment means to me to be able to knock on your neighbor's door and that woman can help you be lifted during a rough time. That's what staying power is to me. So my, uh, my project is about fatherhood. And after doing research on this topic, I found that the absence of fathers really does have a big impact on the black community. And how I plan on really getting it out to, to the public is sharing, sharing interviews by community members about their experiences and you know how, how, how um, the absence of fatherhood may have affected their life and you know, things that we can do better to improve our circumstances. Um, I plan on um, doing, doing a bunch of interviews and you know, photography of that nature. Um, just basically um, sharing with the people like the, like the beauty of, of fatherhood. So through Women Empowerment, we will um, connect at least once a month for a different activity, whether it is a empowerment brunch or a luncheon, we will go virtually three times a week to speak to other women, you know, during rough times so that we can lift them up because through this phase, it was really hard for women. Well, for 20 years, I've worked with the young people of my community. So I decided to base my program around them and the trials and tribulations they have had during the pandemic, still trying to learn. Uh, some children learn better with books. Some children are doing well with the computer, but not everybody. So I would like them people to see the challenges the young people are going through today in this pandemic. Well, for my program, it's basically, um, of course, it's going to be surrounded by fashion because that's, that's what I do. That's my profession. So it's going to be like a fashion show where I'm going to display my staying power, basically, you know, throughout the pieces that I create. 
You know, it's gonna be a, a few different styles and looks that I give, but it's just gonna display my staying power and, and what, what the community has been long awaiting for from me to be on this platform of this magnitude, to be able to give them and show them my staying power, you know, while I'm here. You know, what I'm trying to leave behind, the legacy I'm trying to leave. Through the fellowship, I learned how to work with different kinds of people. That, that was the first one. I learned how that every day is not a good day, but when we came together, we made it a good day. I learned how our kind words can lift others up. I learned how my suggestions can help someone else's project become a better project. And I also got a lot of feedback from the people inside of the fellowship program, which made me enhance things about my program. So it was a great experience altogether. Where I come from, you know, everybody doesn't get the opportunity that I have right now to be a part of this. So that right there just makes it just makes it great, just makes it a good thing. And to be a part of fellowship, I'm just proud. I'm just happy to be here. It has been a very pleasant experience. I've gotten a chance to um, meet with some of the other people with like-minded thoughts to do or to be able to help the community, to help the people, to be there when someone needs help, uh, to answer that call. A lot of times, you know, you see people and you never know until they reach out. Always be ready to answer that call. The fellowship to me is going to be doing that for now and many years to come. Beautiful. Um, so I believe we are beginning to kind of close out our program, but I want to share with you opportunities that you have to join us in the questioning and the, yeah, the deep kind of thought about, um, about what staying power is in your neighborhood. Um, hey, Patricia, you're back. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much, Arielle. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for sharing your evening with us and for tuning in to the sneak peek of Staying Power. Before we sign off, I just wanna share a few more words on what's next. Uh, this outdoor exhibition opens May 1st and runs through July 10th. It's free admission and we've organized in-person socially distanced tours as well as drop-ins from Thursdays to Sundays, 12 noon to 6 p.m. Starting next week, you'll be able to sign up at stayingpowerphilly.com and you can learn more and check out all of our events and programming um, on our social media channels. So follow us at, at the village Philly and at monument underscore lab. Now for special in-person events, we will have limited tickets available and you can sign up online for our opening ceremony. Um, but again, just be on the lookout uh, on our social media cha uh, channels. Staying Power is entirely outdoors and is in compliance with public health guidelines. Please remember to wear a face mask and keep a six foot distance from other visitors to the exhibition. Of course, we understand if you can't make it in person, so we're going to continue to bring the project to you online as all events will be streamed. I wish you health and safety, and thank you so much for sharing this part of your day with us. Have a wonderful evening.